Well, if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Proverbs. We have spent, I don't know, 12 weeks or 14 weeks or something in Proverbs. And uh, this is our last week because Proverbs 31 is where we'll be. And in many ways, we've saved the best for last because today we are talking about finding a godly wife. Now, here's the deal. Um, I thought about uh, for this sermon as an illustration, uh, just having my wife stand up here and being like, look, that's what it looks like. And um, that was good. That was a funny joke, right? That was funny. No? Terrible? Thanks, Jake. Appreciate it, bro. Um, and uh, no, uh, you might be wondering, like, why in the world? I already got a wife. Or uh, I'm a woman. Or I never want to be married. Why in the world would I need to know how to find a godly wife? Well, well the truth is, whether you are already married or whether you uh, uh, will never be married, or whether you will never be in the pursuit of a wife, you need to know this because we all have a part in helping encourage those around us to be godly in the life that God has called them to be in Christ Jesus. If you are already married, you have influence in how you view and see your own wife you have influence in how you are as a wife in shaping the view of those around you who are in pursuing a wife. If you're a young woman, you have standards that you need to hold young men to as they pursue wives. If you are a young man, you got to know what in the world is going on or else you find yourself broken and alone in a one-bedroom apartment wondering where all of your money went because you did not follow God's design for finding a wife. If you have children, you will, you will find yourself at some point, just kind of like the way that it works out. People get married and have babies, and those babies are often young women, and you as a dad or as a mom are encouraging those little girls or encouraging those little boys toward what it is to be something that is to be pursued in godliness or, as a boy, how to pursue a woman who is indeed godly. Because we all know that in a broken world, it doesn't always work out like this. In a broken world, I know many coming in here uh, look at their life and say, I I don't know, I did it all right or whatever, and it didn't turn out like that. And I know that in a sinful, broken world, not everything works out always as it ought to. And praise God, Jesus is coming back to fix that. But nonetheless, there is a pathway that we follow that you kind of, in many senses, get what you fish for, right? Does anyone fish in the room? When I was, um, uh, I, I, I do, I love, I love fishing. I'll fish for anything that will bite anything. In fact, like growing up in Florida, we would fish for gators. That was a lot of fun. We would, um, we figured this out. We took a, uh, a, a saltwater lure and um, lure or wherever you're from, and uh, you take off the hooks and we would throw it out into the middle of ponds and just begin to reel it in. And then suddenly behind the lure, you'd see a little gator pop up and begin to go and then disappear underneath and then bam, like destroy this lure. But it was so dumb, it wasn't hooked, it wouldn't let go. So you just kept on reeling in, reeling in, reeling in. And even when it got on the shore, because of its instinct, as you were pulling, keeping tension on the line, it would maintain that bite on the lure. And all you had to do was jump on it, wrap it up, put some tape around its mouth, and then hide it in your friend's car for them to find. That's all you had to do. And so, yeah, you're welcome. Now you know. And so we let them go. We never, I mean, I'm sure they were shocked and all that, but they bit it again, right? (laughs) They just kept doing that. And so, like, we we understood that if we did not want a gator, we would not fish for them, although sometimes they found us. The analogy breaks down at some point. But my, my point is simply this. You, you understand the principle that you, you, you get what you, what you fish for. Guys, he, as, as, as a pastor for 12 years, most of that working with young adults. 
I cannot tell you how much of my time has been spent working with young men who are fishing for the wrong thing or are setting themselves up to be bait for something that's going to grab on and not let go that you cannot and should not take home. And talking to our, I know what I said, and talking to, and talking to young women and saying, do you not see what culture around you is telling you to act like so that something will bite? And what bites is not going to be what you want. I can't tell you how, how many times I've sat across from a couple to help correct from God's word what God desires to be a husband or a wife because what they are doing going about is inconsistent with the word of God and they're learning this this is not what God designed. And what we learn in scripture is that the the gospel teaches us more than just how to be saved. Like if you're in here and your view of understanding God and his relationship with you is just so that you could become a Christian and then continue your life as you want to. That's not what the Bible describes as having a new life in Christ. That's not what the Bible describes about living a wise life, about living in wisdom. In fact, the book of Proverbs, you remember kind of our theme through the book of Proverbs, begins with Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, and then a few other times where uh, Solomon, the writer of Proverbs, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and fools despise knowledge and instruction. We understand in the New Testament something that Solomon did not yet know fully, that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus Christ. And what Solomon knew partially, we know now that the wise life, the way of wisdom is being like Jesus, in whom is all spiritual knowledge and wisdom. That God's design for you in the gospel when he saves you is not just to get you saved or make you better, but to make you holy and blameless and beyond reproach, just like he is. That the gospel tells us that he became our sin who knew no sin, so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. Righteousness is a a fancy word that just means we would meet the perfect standard that God has in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. You are not perfect. God is perfect. That creates a problem, and God solved it through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when he buys you back, when he restores you, when he meets the standard on your behalf, then gives you the reward of that standard, he gets all of you back to him self. And he makes you like him. That what we know now is the way of wisdom is being like Jesus because God through the gospel is making you like Christ and has before his throne made you like Christ. But this has implications beyond just salvation. This has implications not just to no longer wanting sin, but also wanting the right things. And it has implications not just in right, wanting the right things, but also wanting them and going after them in the right way. And this is something that you just won't learn intuitively from culture. Culture teaches us to think about Finding a wife, or at least now it does, through three significant lenses. They teach us to look, through, look for a wife through Instagram, right? Like posing so everything looks great and putting some filters on it. But we all know that that's not a real picture, right? Or we all know that that's a picture that's doctor, doctored up that had to get the angle right or whatever. Or whatever the newest, like whatever it is, right, of the newest, like, pose. And my goodness, that has implications on how we look for a spouse. We, culture teaches us to look through a, a, look for a wife through the lens of Snapchat. I mean, really, like, 
hold it together for 10 seconds to impress somebody when really, in reality, you spent an hour trying to figure out which puppy dog face you would put so that they would think it was awesome and cute for that 10 seconds. If you're over like 50 in the room and you haven't had teenagers in your house for a while, just stick with me. We'll bring everyone back in in just a minute, okay? Culture teaches us to look through a life through the lens of tender. Oh, I said it. The idea of if I can be presentable enough based on a profile just to be liked or loved, even if it's just for a night, that seems to be an ultimate goal in culture. And here's the problem with that. Filters, whatever it looks like, whether it's just trying to look okay and put together and practicing so that others don't see our flaws and our weaknesses and our failures trying to hold it together, feeling that expectation that if I am myself, that that person or this person or these people would not like me. Uh, Trying to be okay with not a forever relationship has a significant impact in creating impossible expectations both in those who are pursuing godly women, and in godly women who are worth way more than that and ought to be pursued. I can't tell you how many times I've talked with a wife who feels like she's living up to a standard that she will never meet because of a lens that her husband has designed in his head from what has gone on around him and been developed. That if She could just meet this fictional standard and provide more and better sex and expect him to take on less responsibility, then maybe, just maybe, their marriage would be better. And I can't tell you how many guys have come and I've talked with who said that their wife just feels like they can never live up to the hyper-online crazed adulting that 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 she feels like she's broken because her sex drive isn't what her cosmos says it should be and tries to hide every single weakness, not letting anybody else in. And I want you to know that the gospel frees us as, as followers of Christ, as those who are married, as those who are single, as those who are men, as those who are women, to look beyond all of that and see what it is to be a godly woman through the lens of the gospel that fully embraces those weaknesses, that understands there is nothing perfect except for Jesus Christ, that knows that there's a lot more that goes beyond that go, that's going on beyond the 10 seconds that you see somebody on Snapchat and love them unconditionally anyways. And in that freedom, the gospel opens our minds both to be godly women and to know what it is to see a godly woman who ought to be pursued. Y'all, I haven't even gotten to Proverbs 31 yet. This is just like the opening introduction. Because we go through what, well, what, the writer of Proverbs, his son would be going through. Like, this isn't a brand new thing that godly men ought to pursue godly women, and being a godly woman is somewhat ill-defined. And by the way, if you're in here and you're like, you're not talking about what it is to be a godly man, y'all just keep coming back. I promise. (laughs) We're going to get there. But for this morning, the writer of Proverbs 31 is not writing Proverbs 31 So that women have one more thing they can look at and say, man, I could never do all that. I could never live up to that standard. The lens through which, the understanding through which Proverbs 31 was written is a dad talking to his son saying, hey, this is what you look for practically in a wife. Now, we know more fully because we have all of the Bible of what God has intended in marriage. We know more fully what it is when we mean and what we mean when we say husband and wife. We know what it is for a husband and wife, as many of you learn today in your life group discussions, that a husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And what it is for a wife to submit to a husband as a church, as the church does to Christ. 
that this relationship is indeed designed by the gospel. That because of the gospel, the pursuit of a wife isn't like to fulfill your needs. The, because of the gospel, we know that the pursuit of a godly woman and pursuing being a godly woman is to fulfill God's glory through self-sacrifice. And so in Proverbs 31, we get very practically what does it look like to be, what do you see when you see a godly woman? And as those of us, I have never been a woman and I never will be a woman, for those of us in that category, you need to know what you are promoting when you sit down with a man or with a friend or with a husband or with a son and say, hey, listen, looking at the end of chapter 31, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Here's what you look at. Not just does she go to church, not just does she say she's spiritual, but here's what you look at. And here's some things you will see if you're looking for a wife through the lens of the gospel. Because, man, a wife and a husband can make or break you. Y'all know that to be true. You, you know the one earthly relationship ever that exists in this world, earthly relationship, is that of marriage that will have the most profound impact on your life. And God knows that, and he gives us beautiful instruction on what it looks like to pursue what you're looking for young men in a young woman. And the first thing we see in Proverbs chapter 31 in verses 10 through 12 is this. When you're looking for a godly woman, you're looking for somebody that you can trust is for you in private. Like when nobody else is around, you know she has your back, and even when she says negative things about you to you, you know she is for you. Now look at verses 10 through 12 of Proverbs chapter 31. Solomon writes, an excellent, or King Lemuel, not Solomon, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does good to him and not harm all the days of her life. You know how I summarize this when I talk with uh, young men about link, thinking about dating a young woman? Or when I talk with parents in their teenagers about whether or not they should allow their daughter to date this guy or they allow this, their son to date this girl, I just simply ask the question, will this person help you thrive in Christ? I don't mean do they go to church. I don't mean did they go to student camp. I don't mean have they been on a mission trip. I don't mean do they say that they're Christians. I don't mean that they go to church if you go to church. I mean, does this person help you thrive? Do they compel you privately behind the scenes, not just publicly, to be more and more and more like Jesus? In fact, look down at verse 26. And King Lemuel tells his son, one of the descriptions, she opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Uh, that's a phrase that means her correction is wise and kind. Which means, is this somebody that if you were to marry her, when you are with her and she corrects you, it is a good and godly thing? That if you are looking at someone who claims to be a follower of Jesus and you're not yet married, oh, little caveat, if you are married, this is not the time to go home and say, that's not, what, that's not you, right? If that's you, give me a call, shoot me an email, let's get together and talk through this. But as you're looking, you tell those young men, listen, when it comes to finding a bride, you ask the question before she becomes your bride, 
When she corrects you behind the scenes, first of all, does she? Because she ought to. I'm going to say that again. She ought to. I'm going to say that a third time. Husbands, your wife ought to correct you because you need correction. I'm going to say that a fourth time. Husbands, your wife ought to correct you because you need correction. And as you're looking at a girl who you will spend the rest of your life with, as you're talking with your sons about a girl that they're considering dating, as you're, as you're telling your little girls how they are to grow up and how to invest in their relationship with the Lord. You're doing more than just creating a beautiful woman or a strong young man or a strong young woman or a beautiful young man or whatever. You, you want to instill within them a desire to know that be, in the right time, in the right way, at the right moment, they have the power and authority and wisdom and kindness to correct their husband. That if she never has a spiritual thought to correctly correct you in your walk, she may not be ready to be pursued in godliness yet. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that you can trust in private. She is for you. That you can thrive. And you looking at your sons in a dating relationship, at yourselves in a dating relationship, saying, this is a good thing. She helps me be like Jesus, and she does it in the right way. That's a good thing. That she, it, she, you can trust her and that, uh, that she is for you in private. One of the things I like to do uh, whenever I find someone who's been married for a long time, uh, I ask them, like, hey, tell me, like, what's the secret? Long before I was married, uh, I was at this, uh, there was a, a pastor's conference in this city that I grew up in, and um, I was invited by a girl. It was before I met my wife. And, uh, uh, and so I went, not because I wanted to go to a pastor's conference, but because she was nice. And uh, at, during the pastor's conference, they stood up, and uh, whoever was speaking, I think it was, actually it was Jerry Vines, if anyone knows who that guy is. Anyways, it doesn't matter. The point is, like, he said, I just want to recognize so-and-so, he's a friend. Um, he's been married for, uh, he and his wife are celebrating 75 years of marriage together, which is 75 years. Yeah, 75 years. That's a lot of marriage. And so, like... And so I thought, like, seven, anyone who does anything for 75 years, like, anyone who lives for 75 years, I just wonder, like, how'd you make it? You know, like, if you, if you were married for 75 years, like, something went, it went really, really right. You did this well. So afterwards, I went and, uh, and found uh, the husband, and I said, hey, I just, I, I've, I'm obviously not married, and I've never been married, and so, like, hey, what would you tell somebody, what's the key to 75 years of marriage, and uh, he said, well, that's easy. The key is, uh, is, is compromise. So compromise? He said, yeah, in, in most things, we compromise. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I've learned that if she pulls me to the side behind the scenes and she says it, I need to do it. And that is how I've learned to compromise, and that's how we've survived for 75 years. Now, the reason why he was called out is not because just he'd been married for 75 years, but also he had single-handedly uh, 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 discipled and brought to the Lord 900 people in his lifetime. You see, it seems like such a small thing, but man, that man knew and had a godly wife who was compelling him to thrive. Number two, verses 13 through 19, here we go. Not only can you trust that she's for you in private, and man, we're going to instill that. If we're single, we're going we're to um, uh, encourage that in those that are around us. We're going to encourage our married brothers and sisters uh, to be okay, to not be okay with their spouse, to receive appropriate rebuke from their, uh, from their wife. We're going to do that. Even if you're not married, you can encourage those around you to be godly in that way. Number two, here we go. She works hard. Did you know that hard work is always a positive trait in Scripture? 
In fact, one of the prevailing attitudes and actions or conditions of someone in Proverbs who is not wise is that of the lazy person or the sluggard. But this is not a trait of godliness, whether you're male or female, but rather this king is sitting and looking at his son and saying, not only can you trust her behind the scenes, but man, she's got to be a hard worker. First of all, practically, do you know why? Married people, I need you to answer loud and proud on the count of, actually just after I ask the question, no count. You need to be a hard worker because marriage is Marriage is hard, y'all. Marriage is hard. You have somebody who is behind the scenes, always up in your business, saying that's not how it's supposed to be. You can't hide everything from your spouse, and if you are, you know that's not how marriage is. You take two people who've gone their own way for a long time, even if it's just been for a couple of decades. Average uh, age of marriage right now is 27.4 for girls and 29.7 for guys or something like that. That's like three decades of doing your own thing. And then you like slam them together and say, be one, right? Marriage is hard. It is hard work. Look how uh, this king describes a godly woman and her position and what practically it looks like to be a hard worker. Look at verse 13. Uh, The writer writes, she seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. Verse 14. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. Verse 15, she rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. Verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. Verse 17, she dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Verse 18, She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. Verse 19, she puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. Verse 20, she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. Do you see the descriptions of this girl's, this uh, this potential future spouse of this young Man, do you see the hard work through these verses? Verse 13, it's an idiom that means she finds joy in work. Y'all, because of the fall, we talked about this, work is hard. But someone who is glad to work, even if she cannot, oh boy, marriage is hard. And so someone who enjoys work is a good potential characteristic and trait in a future Spouse. Verse 14, she looks for ways to improve the home economy. I mean, sometimes we think, well, she just wants to be a stay at home mom. She must not value anything well. Listen, you know what I've learned since being married? Coupons save like millions of dollars a year. That's not true. I don't ever, will never make that much money. But you get the point, like, hyperbolizing a little bit there. Like, Like the idea of looking at the home or looking at what's coming in, not just home as in house, but home as in household and saying, here's how we can increase our profitability or our availability. Here's here's how we can add to this, always on the lookout for the greater good of the household. Just as a little insider's note, y'all, as someone who's been married, and I'm looking at this group because most of you aren't, and that doesn't make you better or worse. It just makes you single And that doesn't make you better or worse. It just makes you where you are in life. Um, Young guys, you need somebody who's going to tell you not to waste all your money on a truck and debt. I know who I'm talking to because I was there in the military, right? Like, you need somebody who's going to say, don't do that. Or at least if they do that, say, I'm in your corner, right? Like, we're in this together. But my point is, like, you, you need somebody who's looking out for someone other than yourself. Verse 15, a hard worker is simply not lazy. She rises early and she cares for others. She provides food for her household and portions to her maidens. In other words, this particular person who this prince would be marrying, who would be a queen, 
may not be directly involved with preparing the food, but she's making sure that there's food for those who are under her roof, who are under her care. And she's making sure to do what she needs to do when she does it so that they are cared for. Man, a little pro tip, listen. Getting up early is more about going to bed at the right time than it is getting up early and still going to bed at the same time. But the point is that the need goes above the needs of her own, which goes into the rest of these verses. She thinks about the future in verse 16. Look at what it says. She looks at a, beer, at a field. She th- considers it. And she goes, this is worthy of our money going towards because it has future potential gain. Verse 17 through 20, she's built for strong, generous work. Now, this is going to take some fun exegetical uh, uh, exercise, but we're going to work through this together. We're going to laugh a little bit, and then we're going to see what the writer of Proverbs means for us. Verse 17, she dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Literally, she girds her loins with strength, right? Some of your translations say that. Looking, saying like, not just like, man, how much can she like... um, leg press, you know, like, she's got some strong legs, like, it's not like a cattle run, like, you're, like, but the idea is, like, yeah, she can work, and whether it's, it has nothing to do with being physical, but rather, like, when it comes to getting the work done, marriage is hard, life is hard, curveballs get thrown, I know that I can rely on her for the strength that she brings. She is built for work. Verses 18 and 19, not defined by the nine to five, Listen, just young men, young women, old men, old women, and everyone in between. No one has changed the world by being stuck to a 35-hour work week working 9 to 5. Pick any example in history of those who have made great work and great leaps for the sake of the gospel. And I tell you what, the cultural uh, definition of a work week at least in that definition, just simply doesn't exist. Now, family life balance is another conversation. Workaholics is, that's, like, that's sin. You know that. Neglecting your family for the sake of somebody else's deadline is just straight up sin, or at least doing that regularly all the time. But the point here is that she is built for strong, in verse 20, generous work. And then continuing on, hard work. She's, when she is clothed well, and you might not say, well, you might look, look at verse 21 and 22. She's not afraid to, of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. That was like a big deal, being clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself, her clothing in fine linen and purple. And this is just poetic language to help us understand that what you're looking for is someone who knows to look out and care for those around them. That's what it looks like to work hard because it is a dual responsibility when you get married to make sure those in your house are cared for. Maybe I ought to say that for some of our guys in the room as well. It is a dual responsibility when you are married to care to make sure that those in your house are cared for. It is hard work. And then last but not least, verse 23. The king writes, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. I don't know if you have ever met somebody and uh, met a husband and then you meet their wife or the other way around where you meet a wife, and then you meet their husband, and it totally changes your perception of who they are. You see, we understand that kids aren't perfect. We do. But we know there's something off when we look at a marriage relationship, and the husband is apparently thriving, and the wife is devastated. And likewise, We know there's something off. Radars, alarms go off in our mind and in our spirit 
When we meet a wife who seems like she's thriving and we meet somebody who is a shell of a person as a husband, we go, whoa, there's something really off here. What the writer of Proverbs here is saying is that when it comes to the elders, that is the the people who kind of make up the leadership of that area, when the husband's name comes up because of the reputation of the wife, they take him seriously. That because they know he's married to her and they know her reputation and how she speaks of him, his reputation precedes him long before he even goes face to face with those who are in leadership. That a characteristic of a godly wife in that relationship as a young man, what you're looking for is she represents us because we are we, and what does she represent to others? Now again, we'll get to the guys sometime. I promise we will. But looking, talking to a young man saying, listen, practically what does godliness look like lived out? Man, it looks like day to day you can trust her in private conversation that she's for you. It looks like day to day that when nobody else is looking, when you see her, she works hard. It looks like day to day you know that when when she represents we you will be represented well in public, looking like a godly young woman day to day looks like Jesus in your life. That's what you look for. You know as a follower of Christ, Jesus is working his spirit in you to make you not just publicly look godly, but privately correcting you. You know as a follower of Christ that Christ is always at work and not defined by a cultural box of when he should and should not work and what areas he should and should not work in your life. You know that as a follower of Christ, among those who are spiritual leaders, your reputation is based on whether or not you are representing him and he is all over you. What does it look like in a nutshell as a young man for our young men who are being raised up, for our young women who are pursuing a picture of godliness in Scripture? You are looking for someone who will make you like Jesus Because the way of wisdom is being like Christ. You want to wisely pursue somebody? Look for someone who is wisely making you more and more like him. I could have just said that. We could have been done 32 minutes ago, right? So what do we do we do with this? Well, here we go. Number one, if you are a woman, be godly. Man, I know it is way more complex than this. Or rather, this, the answer is simple, but living it out is complex. If you are a woman, whether you are married or single or young or older, be godly. If you are a married woman, the godly example that you set, you're teaching young men what it means to see a godly wife and how a wife should talk about, treat, and respect her husband. If you are a married woman, you are setting an example to the young women what it looks like to be a godly married woman. If you are a married woman, you are setting the example for those who are single of what ought to be praised and what ought to be looked down on as they also influence those around them to be godly in their marriage and in their singleness. Be godly. Be godly. If you are a single woman, you are setting the example of what all of us will again be one day because marriage ends after this life. You are like decades ahead of where I will ever be because I have been married that when I stand before Jesus and my marriage is done because life has passed, 
you will have decades of serving God fully as a kingdom-minded, single person that I do not have. I need to know what that looks like as you set the example of what it looks like to be fully devoted to God in Jesus Christ. Y'all be godly. Young ladies, be hard, be hard to get because of your godliness. Be hard to get. Man, don't take off the hooks or add them or whatever so you get something that shouldn't be binding. Be godly. Make it hard so that what does come about is drawn to your godliness. Be godly. Number two, here we go. If you're a man, promote godliness. Man, every... And praise God, we are at a time, at least now in our culture, where this is bec- we're becoming more and more aware. But every misogynistic, sexist remark or meme that you repost on Facebook says something. It says something. Every time you participate with language or attitudes toward women that should not be approved or raised up, it says something. Every time as a dad, you develop within your daughter, oh, absolutely, that they are beautiful, but there is so much more to life than that, where you are compelling them not just to be beautiful, but to be godly. That says something to them. Every time you're quick to approve of your wife with a dress that she has, but fail to observe when she is dressed in godliness in a situation, that says Something, man, as a man, when it comes to changing the culture of our young men and women being godly and pursuing someone who is godly, they're looking to us who are older and a little bit longer in life to see what it looks like to praise godliness. If you are a man, promote godliness. And last but not least... And this is what we're going to do for our time of response. We're going to just take an inventory, everyone in the room, of our priorities of what being a wife means. In fact, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in here today and you are a woman and you're single, How have you thought about your influence around those around you who are married or who are pursuing marriage and shaping their view of what it means to be a godly wife? I want you to know that singleness is a beautiful thing in Scripture. Nothing wrong or broken with you. You have a profound ministry towards those who will one day be married for a while, then be back like you again. When it comes to shaping the view of the girls and women around you of what it means to be someone who will one day be a godly wife or to be a godly wife as a wife, how have you viewed your role? This week, what is one step you could take to to help them who are not yet married, pursue being a godly woman, or who those who are married, pursue being a godly woman in their marriage. If you're a married woman in the room, how have you viewed your role as being a godly wife? Now, here's, I don't ask that question to heap a bunch of shame on you and say, shame on you. You should have known this before you got into this thing. That's not the gospel. Like, Welcome to the club. You're not perfect. But this week, when it comes to the example that you set for the girls that are around you and how you live out your own godliness in Christ Jesus in your life, what would it look like to live godly? You have a profound incredible ministry 
both in those who are not married and those women who will never be married and those women that are married to show this is what it looks like to be godly and a wife. This is what it looks like. You have a profound impact on those young men who are not married, on those men who will never be married, on those men who are already married. This is what it looks like to be a godly wife. This is what you're going after. This is what you're going after. If God's called you to marriage. If you're a man in the room, Have you been affirming something that is more culturally driven or driven by scripture when it comes to being a godly woman? If you're unmarried, if you're a single man in the room, what have you been pursuing if God's calling you to marriage? What have you been really pursuing as the standard that if those things aren't true, it's broken? Has it been more informed by Instagram, Snapchat, and Tinder than it has Scripture? If you're a married man in the room, part of the beauty of why God has your wife in your life is because you need to be made more like Jesus. How do you respond when she corrects you in private? or even in public. Where does your heart go? You have a profound chance to minister to those who are not yet married, who will never be married, and who are already married. This is what it looks like to have a godly wife. She corrects me, and it's a beautiful thing. For all of us in here, let's take some time to think and pray and walk out of here more in love with Jesus and more like him ready to affirm godliness in current future and those who will never be married because this life this marriage does not exist to fulfill our needs but to fulfill God's glory There's one last group and then I'll be quiet. If you're in here today and you're not a follower of Christ, the answer isn't to try to be more godly. You're God, you, you, you cannot get to God by yourself. It's just not going to work. Today, if you would say, I'm not a Christian and I know that I'm not a Christian, the solution isn't examining your marriage, although you do need someone to help you with that. The solution is first beginning with your relationship with God from which all these other things stem. So today as we respond, if you've never believed in Jesus, if you've never confessed your sin to him, if you've never asked him to forgive you, if you've never received new life in Christ, I would ask that as we sing, you'd come talk with me. Or afterwards, I'll be at the guest reception area and I'd love to have a conversation with you about what it means to be a Christian. That being said, I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite you to stand after I pray, but you don't have to. You're welcome to sit and continue to think and pray. And then at the end, I'll come back up and close this out and we'll walk out of here more in love with Jesus and more like him than when we came. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for being our king. We ask, Lord, that you would help us. This is so not natural for us to promote godliness in those around us. Lord, teach us how to be like you in the stage of life you have us in and how to pursue what it means to be godly in whatever you're calling us to when it comes to promoting godliness in current and future wives, whether we're married or not. We love you, Jesus.